Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Guzman. I'm the Curator of Public Programs at Torpedo Factory Arts Center. Welcome to the Late Shift. This is our Late Shift ALX Pride. Today is Friday, June 11th. Uh, this is a unique one in that we have a hybrid program tonight. There's an online portion and also in person. Uh, so what you're watching now is the online portion, which will run from 7 to 8 p.m. And there's also an in-person component happening at the Arts Center. So if you happen to be in Old Town, Alexandria, we have activities on the Union Street side. It was originally going to be Union Street and Waterfront, but because of the rain, we've adjusted it where the exhibition is still on the Union Street side, but the components with Safe Space Nova and printmaking is going to be inside the atrium space, which you can access through the Union Street side. So if you're down here, feel free to stop by after the video is done. Um, all this is being recorded, so that way there will be a video component later on as well. Even if you're not watching it live, you'll be able to share it out with your friends. Um, thank you again for being a part of ALX Pride. So, brief history of it, ALX Pride was developed in 2018 as a community-focused event to celebrate LGBTQ plus identifying creatives in the Alexandria area and beyond. The Art Center is pleased to bring back this event and provide these projects. Um, so, if you like what we do, please let us know. We want to encourage having more of these activities. So, thank you for being a part of this. Again, my name is Daniel Guzman, and now I'm going to turn it over to the curator of exhibitions, Leslie Monemi. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Monemi. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and uh, we're going to get into our artist talk with our solo artist, um, our 2021 solo opportunity in Target Gallery was, um, the recipient for it is artist Omolara Williams McAllister. And Omolara is um, based all over the Mid-Atlantic at this time, um, but has a um, operating space in Massachusetts right now, as well as out of Baltimore, and will be in DC this summer to have some in-person elements in the exhibition, which we'll talk more about. Um, but Omolara um, is going to give us just a little bit of a talk about the exhibition and how the inspiration and goals came about. And then we're also gonna welcome two of our jurors. So we had a jury panel of three jurors, um, Antonia Stingui, um, Michelle Carlson and Deirdre Darden uh, were our jury, our jury panel for this opportunity. And Deirdre and Antonius are here with us today. So I'll have everyone kind of uh, do an introduction of, of themselves um, when they start talking, but we're gonna start off with Omolara first and uh, we're just gonna get into what this exhibition is about. So this exhibition is called We Too Sing America. And um, it is a, a multi-sensory exhibition in that there are um, interactive elements to this exhibition. So um, it's a little preview of uh, the work is behind me here. Um, uh, the installation uh, comprises of, of Muslim square fabrics that Omolara has uh, created with the phrases for you, for me, and for us that can take over the gallery space. And the exhibition is intended to really um, encourage viewers and um, individuals to think about um, their own health and um, community healing um, in, a in a sense of togetherness. So I'll let Omolara really get in depth with that and exactly what O's intentions were. Um, and please feel free to leave us some comments uh, for O in the chat. If you are interested in asking Omolara a question, um, please feel free to leave it in the chat. We are going to open this up for Q&A after Omolara finishes uh, talking. Um, and we will also um, facilitate a conversation with the jurors after Omolara is talking as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to O. Oh, you ready? Hi, yeah, I'm trying to figure out because we're on Facebook Live, so I'm trying to figure out how to see people and be able to talk to them while also being on Zoom. Um, so I will totally uh, respond to y'all's comments. I love the chat feature of, um, of Zoom and I'm not sure how to do it between Zoom and Facebook, but we're gonna figure it out. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the 
the installation and how it came to be and what it is and what it means. I think a lot of the people that I've seen already online so far have experienced this in some form. So it's always really exciting to be able to share with folks who are like there at the beginning and are now able to see this in its various forms. So as Leslie said, the title for the, the show is We Too Sing America. And this is a panoramic view. Throughout this presentation, I'm gonna use photos from my personal archive. And I'm also gonna use these beautiful installation shots, which are by photographer Reese Bland of RB Creative. So this is a panoramic view of how the piece currently exists in the gallery without the projection component, which I'll talk about a little later. So to start, I wanna play this video that has me talking over it that just gives a basic overview, but also I think that I don't know how to share audio. So let's see if it starts with the audio. This is video Can documentation the audio? of a partial installation of a piece entitled Domestic Work, which is kind of a large cumulative installation piece that I've been building over two years through conversations with people in various communities. Uh, the piece features these three subtexts that you're starting to see, the for you conversations that I had with people about experiences of codependency, of self-harm and substance abuse, and what sorts of things were happening or they were doing in those relationships as a super text of for me, which documents people's kind of commitments to self-care in moving through that codependency to a place of kind of independence and healthy relationship with themselves and others and substances and various practices. And then for us, that part has evolved in response to the COVID-19 pandemic as people have been cultivating cultures of collective care within their communities. So yeah, that's kind of the basic spiel about the piece And this backyard video was part of what I uh, submitted with my application for the solo show. And I love it because it allows you to see the piece from far away. So from far away, you kind of get this blue skyscape and then to approach it where then you're able to see those large super texts for you, for me, for us, and then gives you an idea as you're at home of then the subtext that got sober one is my favorite because it's the only one that I managed to actually do the text, the opposite directions where one part is upside down. Um, and it's funny to me because of course it says got sober and you're like, did you though? Um, but it's the only one like that out of 700. I don't know how that happened and it wasn't intentional, but it did. So this is the, a portion of the piece that's much smaller than what is up at the gallery. But again, I like this video because it gives you this idea of what it looks like from close up, what it looks like from mid range, which is what we're seeing now where you can kind of see the words. And then as you back away from it, it's really just this kind of blue skyscape that in the gallery is floating on a back black background. So most of my work I see in my mind as existing on a black background. And I think that perhaps some of that comes from having started in theater in the black box, but that's the space that I think of for creation. And so in the gallery, I've created a black background here uh, with Velcro, which I'll talk about a little later. This is video nope. documentation. There we go. So, a major component of this piece is that it's a conversation. Uh, it started, as I said, with me reflecting on codependency in my life and really healing from that and working through that, doing the emotional labor um, to move through it. This entire piece is about labor and I'm kind of gonna organize the talk around the ideas of emotional labor, physical labor, and then intellectual labor. So clearly this emotional labor is shown on the squares, all of these different individual acts. But then there's another aspect that isn't exactly visible in the installation of the piece, which is throughout the time that I was making this, I spent a lot of time making in public spaces. So here I am making on an airplane. And some of that is you know, a, a choice that I intentionally make at this point in my life. But initially it wasn't a choice. It was just because that was the time and space that I had to be able to create art. And so I made it in the in-between spaces of having to work to live. And that would be like when I was on public transportation or when I was sitting and eating at a cafe and people don't see people 
doing hand sewing period and definitely don't see them doing it in public like at brunch or on an airplane or waiting for a bus and so a lot of people would be like what are you you know what are you doing and i would explain to them what the project was and i would read to them the square and then often they would volunteer a story of their own back to me and we'd have a conversation about you know what was that labor how did they feel about that in their life uh, and then I would ask, can I include your story in this story? And we would work to get it down to, you know, those three, four or five words that they felt summarized it. And so much of it is my personal story, but also there are these places where uh, people have inserted themselves, which is really important to me so that it becomes a collective arc. There are several ways that people can, you know, contribute. One is through having those conversations, which on my part, you know, are an act of emotional labor in the sense that it's labor that I'm doing facilitating those conversations. But then also when the piece is up, this is a picture of it being up in my studio at Maryland Institute College of Art, uh, where I got a degree recently. I would ask people to pick squares that resonated with them and to take portraits with them, which was also a way of them adding their narrative. This is an image of a friend interacting with the piece in the gallery uh, at Torpedo Factory, the Target Gallery, where it is now. And this is a picture of one of my students actually um, here at the Courier Museum. So I'm currently the artist in community. I'm at an artist residency at the Courier Museum in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, and through that residency, I've been doing indigo-based workshops with various groups, one of them making art accessible, which is a suite of classes for adults with developmental disabilities. And they have been primarily over Zoom. They've been completely over Zoom actually. But one of my students came in to um, open studios, a lot of information about what I'm doing, but I've been hosting weekly Oakland studios hybrid online, in person, physically at the Courier and then online with Biz Arts Center where I'm the year long, um, fellow for arts and social justice. And so my student came in and I did a partial installation of the piece and she was able to interact with it and add her picture um, to it. The way that those images then get incorporated into this larger narrative, uh, this is a video, is that there, this video and a couple other versions of it, including those images are projected on top of that blue scape that you see and they pop up in different areas at different timing. And for me, that was about creating this visual facsimile of what it's like for people to talk back. So I grew up in the black church and in the black church spaces, when people are speaking or preaching, you know, from the pulpit, people who are in the audience are not just kind of silent people that are there watching, they're people that are interacting and having a conversation with the speaker by verbalizing in response to, or sometimes making sound or like body motions in response to what the speaker is saying. So there's this conversation happening. I wanted to create a sense of that for people while they were in the galleries, a sense that like, this is a collective narrative and there are other people here who are having and sharing these kinds of experiences. And so the way that I'm doing that is through having this video which also creates a sense of motion as the things are moving through the gallery. So even if you're in there by yourself, you don't feel like you're by yourself and you're able to see kind of the other people who share these uh, stories with you. Maybe that's two slides. Nope. Yes. So also at the Courier Museum, this is a, an image of their smart classrooms that I've been teaching out of and also doing open studios out of. And this is the open studio set up. Another way that I've created for people to interact with, be in conversation, is through these paper squares, which are formatted to look like the, the cloth squares. And each of them has a prompt on the back for people to then write a narrative and then condense that narrative down to the four or five words that go on the front of the squares. And you can see that a picture of the work for my website is up on the screen so that people can see that. And there's a flyer here that talks about, provides the language about the installation that's there at the Target Gallery. And then there's this wall where I have a couple of the pieces that I kept, a couple of squares so that they can physically see what those squares look like. And then they can add their paper stories to it. So we're doing the same thing at the Target Gallery in Alexandria. And I will collect these paper squares from here at the Courier Museum and from there at the Target Gallery, and I will translate them into embroidered squares. So this work, even though I'm showing it, is still in progress. It's not done. Uh, it's still growing. The number that I have in my mind for squares is 1,440, which is the number of minutes in a day. Again, talking about labor. 
and emotional labor. It's something that we're constantly doing. And when I say we, I'm thinking about um, people in groups who share identities with me uh, where we are constantly expected to be performing emotional labor for other people. So in particular, when I started this, I was thinking about the work that Black women and people who are identified as Black women have been and are expected to do all the time and the ways that emotional labor is extracted and expected and exploited from us and has been since and before the founding of this country and what's that like, what that is like. And that emotional labor often takes the form actually a physical labor. So here on the screen, what you're seeing now are two physical and intellectual labor are two uh, poems. And both of these poems kind of inform, not kind of directly inform the work. And so I've referred to the body of blue squares as domestic work. And I think of the body of blue squares, their name as an art piece, even though each of them is individually an art, art piece. And we'll get to that um, as domestic work. And I took that title from a poem by Natasha Trethewey, who was the poet laureate of the United States from 2012 to 2014 and is currently a professor at Emory University. In Emory University. I'm gonna read the poem. Um, All week she's cleaned someone else's house, stared down her own face in the shine of copper, bottomed, copper bottom pans, polished wood, toilet she pulled a lid to that look saying, let's make a change, girl. But Sunday mornings are hers, church clothes starched and hanging, a record spinning on the console. I moved the mouse. A record spinning on the console, the whole house dancing. She raises the shades, washes the rooms in light, buckets of water, octagon soap. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Windows and doors flung wide, curtains two stepping forward and back, neck bones bumping in the pot, a choir of clothes clapping on the line. Near my God to thee. She beats time on the rugs, blows dust from the broom like dandelion spores, each one a wish for something better. So that poem you know, is from a collection of poems, which is also titled Domestic Work, and it was her first collection of poems. And the entire collection speaks to the domestic labor that Black women did largely in white people's homes. And one of the things that I noted when I read that poem was just the way that this woman works six days a week for a white family and then comes home and does the same work for herself, which there's a sense of joy in the poem of being able to do this for her own household. But it's like, damn, when do you rest? You know, it's like you're cleaning toilets all week and then you come home and you're beating rugs on Sunday, the one day that you have off, you know, and then you're going to go to church, which is a supportive emotional space. But also it's like, can we get a break at some point? And then the title of the entire uh, installation that is domestic work plus the projection plus the performance piece, which I'll be doing, which I'll speak to is We Too Sing America. And I pulled that title from a poem by Langston Hughes. I too sing America, I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. And so I see also these two poems, domestic work really reflecting this for you aspect, which is the first um, and also the place where I started in the work. And then I see I too moving to the for me and for us, you know, where it says, besides, they'll see how beautiful I am, but also it speaks to this tomorrow where nobody will say eat in the kitchen, this, you know, different space and place of being. So there's that. Um, and then, and I'm almost done, let me look at time. Uh, and then there's the physical labor. So in those poems, you also see that there's emotional labor that people are doing and caring for the folks around them and having to deal with, you know, anti-Blackness, white supremacy and racism. Uh, but that's translated into physical labor of house cleaning and cooking and having to move your body to be in certain parts of space. So this piece, when we think of physical labor, it's a textile fiber-based piece. Most of my work involves textiles or fibers, and I love them because of how familiar they are to everybody. We spend our entire life in fibers. Most of us right now are wearing clothes. I mean, maybe some of you aren't most, we'll say most. Most of us are wearing clothes, which are made of textiles. We sleep in sheets. You know, Our bodies are constantly in contact with fabric, and so it's something that's intimately familiar to all of us. Uh, something that holds smell, something that has texture and feeling, something that holds, um, you know, visual 
marks of the ways we've lived our life. If you got something dirty or got it burned or stained at some point, then you kind of remember those markers on the cloth of the fibers of your clothes or your curtains or your sheets or whatever. But it's also something like this emotional labor that I'm talking about that we take for granted because of the globalization of labor, which is to say that we've now exploit less people in the United States in the textile industry. And I'm sitting now in Manchester, New Hampshire, which was a mill town. So this town was started as a company mill town where they got immigrants, white immigrants to come here, work for the mills. It was like the mill owned your housing, the mill sold your food, you know, that kind of system, which is quite similar actually to sharecropping and directly related because what were they milling? Where did the things that they were milling into textiles come from if you're making cotton? then the cotton came from the South, right? Which is another segue on the North says we didn't have slaves, but you benefited from slavery, right? So you've got this you know, textile that now that we don't do that textile production labor in the United States, because we've moved it and globalized it and invisibilized it largely, we take for granted the labor that goes into producing textile and fiber-based things. And so I'm just gonna run you through, and then Leslie, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna run you through the labor that goes into making these pieces, each individual piece is a unique work of art. No two are the same. They weren't printed. Uh, each one is hand lettered. So I hand letter it without stenciling. And then it's hand embroidered. I embroider over the letting, lettering with a, a chain stitch. And then I do the lettering for the wax, which will happen, which is again by hand. Each square is a different size. I didn't standardize the size of them because I wanted them to have that um, feel that hinted to the idea that they were all individual and separate. And then they're dyed in organic natural indigo vats and rinsed and hung to dry. And these images that we're moving through move through all the spaces that I've worked in. So you know, airplanes, and then my studio at Maryland Institute College of Art, and then my house in Boston that burned down, and then the house that I'm currently living in. This is them drying on lines um, in my uh, residence that I've been in here in Manchester across the street from the museum. Back to the mica kitchen, you boil the wax off. I left out a picture, a thing here. So they're waxed, which I guess I didn't put the image in, but I apply wax over the letters so that the indigo won't go into that space. And then I dry them, and then I have to boil that wax off of each of them. And then I have to dry them again, my bathroom in Boston. And then I attached Velcro to the back of them because the walls in the exhibition space are not black paint. They are actually black soft Velcro. And the reason that they're black soft Velcro is so that people can interact with them. So I'm gonna see the floor but I am going to play in the background of our first bit of talking this uh, video of interaction. And so one of the kind of final ways or not final, maybe final is not the word for it, but one of the other ways that people can interact with the piece is actually by pulling the pieces off of the wall and physically moving them around to be able to create their own narratives uh, on the walls of the space. And I'm just struggling with my computer and the internet. See if I can get this screen share. But I've lost my Zoom video. There's my Zoom video. Share screen. Here we go. This doesn't have audio, so I'll just play it and we can chat on top of it. I'm done for now. Thank you. Oh, that was really um, interesting. Obviously, you know, as I've been working with you with this installation, it's um, been really just interesting just to learn more and more about how this project started. Um, so I was just gonna ask a few questions first before I opened it up to the jurors to um, join us in this dialogue. Um, so my first question for you is, is a logistical question. And can you, I think the, the process of making for you is so interesting and um, very integral in the, the physical labor that goes into this work that you're doing. And I love how you talk, address, you know, how you are, often making the work in transient spaces. Um, so I'm interested to see kind of how you got, um, 
how your work has evolved uh, from this uh, fiber material to, um, I mean, you are, you're a trained singer um, and that now you're incorporating um, that into your work as well. Um, can you just talk a little bit on the evolution of your work um, as a fiber installation sculpture artist? Yeah, and when you see me looking down, it's to respond to people on the Facebook. Uh, so an interesting thing, it's, it's a thing that you could think of as an evolution, but uh, people who were there with my first studio visit would know that when I actually first envisioned the project, I envisioned it with song and sound. And I did that first studio visit with a different, um, with the original composition. But what I didn't speak to, and thank you for prompting me, is that another aspect of this installation is that I'll be doing a 24 day uh, durational performance. And so every day for 24 days, I'll come in and I'll sing for an hour. And then that, you know, the first day it'll be silent. I'll sing in the gallery for an hour, I will record it that will become the soundtrack to the gallery. And then the next day I'll come in and I will sing over the recording and I will add that day two recording, which has the first day with the second day on top of it to the back of it. So the recording will be day one and then day one and day two. And I'll keep doing that cumulatively. So by day 24, there'll be a 24 hour long recording because it's an hour every day. And the 24th hour will have 24 layers of my voice singing with myself um, over it. And for that recording, I was really thinking about accumulation, which as you can see, accumulation and repetition is something that's an important part of my practice um, in the fibers. And I think uh, the singing, there are multiple things. I, so the song that I'll be singing is Walk With Me. And I know uh, Valeska and Ursula are watching. And I think Glinda is also here. Teresa, I think, has been in a class, but while I was uh, part of the Natural Dye Initiative, uh, Natural Dyes is an intercultural connector course at Maryland Institute College of Art, so many acronyms I'm trying to avoid. Um, I would open our class with the same song and I used it to teach about community organizing, uh, various things like divergent tactics and, um, uh, fluid leadership, like shit people, because I would have people pass who was leading the song or being able to do multiple things at the same time, um, polyrhythm. So I do one rhythm, you do another rhythm. And these were like not people who sang and not people who sang spirituals, but they learned to do it over a semester. And so the song that I'm using, using for that reason, it's a part of my organizing work and has been, uh, but also because in the time of COVID, one of the things that I've just been thinking about is collective action and how before COVID, I often just conceived of it as collective action, lots of individual people doing the same thing together. And so then it's collective action. And now I'm also starting to conceptualize it, of it in a couple of different ways. One, a single person doing many act and single action over and over again, collective action. So you think about someone making a commitment to recycle, for example that becomes an action that they are making a collective of that individual actions, but then you get a whole neighborhood to do it. And so it's collective action multiplied by collect collective action, which essentially becomes systems change. And so this um, way that I'm working with music for me is again, like a musical or artistic representation of this communal practice and uh, highlighting of the ways that even when we're working kind of individually by ourselves, we're also working together because I'll be singing with myself and inviting people who are in the galleries to sing or contribute sound in whatever uh, way they want. But throughout the pandemic, this idea of like laboring song and singing over myself was the way that I approximated choral singing, which is my favorite kind and which I miss. And it made me feel um, supported and less alone and also it was a way for me to conjure spirit. And so to be also with the ancestors and with spirit guides. And so this, I am not alone. I can call people to walk with me. Thank you. Um, yes, we'll um, definitely be posting and sharing about um, the performance. So stay tuned for that. Um, There'll be lots to see if you can physically come to the gallery. We'd love to have you there um, during one of the performances or just any time. Um, 
so one of the, um, we have the um, visitor contributed um, squares, right, going on in the gallery and people are having a lot of fun with it. I, I honestly feel like the, the responses we've gotten are very wholesome and just really uplifting, which is again, the point I think of the show is to really think about how we're uh, connecting as a community and people are just being very sweet with it. Um, and a lot of them have been going through and trying to pick out, you know, oh, like, this is me, this is me, this is me. Um, in terms of the, the ones that you made, oh. Um, so I was wondering if you could, um, for the folks that, you know, aren't able to physically see the work uh, in front of us right now, um, kind of uh, talk about the for you, for me, for us. Um, you, Cause you talked about how the, uh, the for you was first, right? Um, for you anyway and kind of um, maybe just some examples of what, um, of some of the squares that you've made. I mean, you've made quite a few, but um, just be great for people to get a sense of uh, what some of those contributions that you've made are. Yeah, so uh, the video briefly spoke to that, to the idea of codependence, independence, interdependence, and so the, one of the videos I didn't include because time um, is that my, this piece started as a list. It started as a list. I almost want to go get the list. It's over there. It's in this really tiny book that wanders around with me because I use it to scratch things off when I make the squares. I was uh, in a relationship that mirrored relationships, codependent relationships that I'd had with my parents. And I kept wanting to go back to that relationship, which was not supportive of me. And so I needed a tool to help me not go back to that codependent relationship. Um, and that was a list. I started writing a list of all of the things that I had done for you, where the you that I was speaking to was uh, that partner, but it was also my parents, my biological parents, but it was also other people that I'd been in relationship with over my life because I had developed and adapted this form of being in codependent relationship with each other. So there were all these things where I was like, I'm doing these things for other people, uh, not necessarily because I want to, but because I feel like I'm obligated to, or I have to, I'm often doing them at the expense of myself. Um, and so I'm doing them for you. And one of the things that's happened in interacting with this piece is that I've been surprised about is that everybody makes a different you in their brain. So if I ask people, who is the you in this situation? People will be like, oh, my kid, that one was the most surprising. I was like, oh damn, I hadn't thought about that. I ain't got no kids, but yes. Yeah, you totally could be like, yeah, I have to do all these things for my kid. They're a kid, right? Um, or yeah, my kid, my wife, you know, my friends, my educational institution, the organization that I work from, there are all these places that people are having labor extracted and having their labor exploited. And the way that the piece actually evolves was I was at a residency at Vermont Studio Center, which was the first place that I was in a residency. And I'm mentioning all of these organizations, uh, not as a way to kind of like clout boost or name drop, but because it's really important to me to share information as an artist about how other artists can get support for their work and, um, and be able to exist it as an artist. And so for me, these residency spaces have really supported me financially in terms of having space, in terms of having critical feedback and being able to develop this piece, but also develop my career. So while I was at Vermont Studio Center, which is a great first residency for folks, uh, one of the critics who was there, um, Odili Donald Odita said, these for you squares, you know, this is a great piece. It's very strong. That's a lot of trauma on the wall. What are you going to do to take care of people? How are you going to close them up after you drag them, you know, through this situation? I was like, oh, damn, I hadn't thought about that. But you're right. That's important. And it's in align with my, alignment with my values to take care of people. And so then I began to write uh, the for me squares. So the idea was, okay, cool. So codependent relationships, extraction of the exploitation of labor, that's happening here. And then what's next? And so for me and my healing journey, what was next was really focusing on me. What did I need? What were the kinds of things that I needed done uh, for me? And so I began to write the list and it was both uh, aspirational and actual in the beginning. So some of the things were like, oh, I want to do this for me, but I'm not doing it yet. Um, and I was really excited to see actually when I was putting the squares that are done together for the exhibition, 
um, that the largest pile, I'm gonna move out of the frame, but I'm gonna come back, ended up being for me. Um, and I didn't, I had so many squares of the for me squares that I didn't even get to finish like waxing and dyeing all of them. So like this entire stack of squares, which is probably about 150. So they're stacked in tens. Um, are all for me squares that, and when I set them on the table, it's like the for you ones, which were once all of them are kind of this big and the for me ones are huge. And then there's um, the for us ones, which I started in pandemic. So I had been doing the for, for me, for you's and I had been doing the for me's and I was doing those simultaneously because I hadn't even gotten through my entire original list that I wrote to help support myself getting out of this relationship when I started doing the for me ones. Um, but I kept doing them. So some of them, to your point of reading them, the for me stack that I have in front of me, I'll read 10 of them. It says reveled in joy, practiced, wrote, grew, applied, asked, shined, rested, found peace, made a family uh, are the for me squares that I have uh, here. And then within the pandemic, there was this moving as I was working towards uh, collective care, really on a societal scale, which I hadn't seen before. It's something that's been happening in my communities uh, for some time. And I'm really thankful for those of you in my chosen family. There are many of you who are watching now. Uh, so I started to list those actions again, actual things that are happening and aspirational things that are happening. I'm gonna go off screen slightly again. Uh, but was asking like, what are the things that we're doing uh, for us to take care of us in community spaces? Oh, I have some held use that I, I mean, for us, for use that I could read. And so the for us came and that was things that we're doing to, to take care of each other. And so the interesting thing there too is that the tense changed from past tense to present or future tense or command. So all of these like held your stories um, here's a stack of for you. So for example, had held your stories for you, neglected myself for you, kept your secrets for you, explained empathy as a concept for you, named the dynamics at play for you, explained emotional intelligence for you, advocated for your needs for you. And those are all past tense because also hopefully being in those relationships are past tense. But then with the four us's, some of them were present, some of them were command, some of them were future. So it says, decenter yourself, which is not decentered, but it's it's a command. Decenter yourself for us. Um, but then this one is past tense, spoke out for us, spoke up for us, imagined new futures for us, then imagine new futures for us, grow for us, hold space for us, hold it for us, and then have hope for us. And so it's been, it's been an interesting and kind of organic process that I, to some extent, you know, have wanted a certain amount of artistic control or direction over it, but in other ways have really had to release it, like having the squares be whatever color blue they decided to be, or the stitching is pretty, you know, consistent and great, but I can also look at some of the squares, particularly the for you squares, and I can see how difficult a time I was having because the stitches are so tight. They're so small and tight and close together. And my embroidery work gets that way when my body feels that way. Whereas you can see like the stitching in this square, for example, I don't know if you can see that, but the stitching in this square is pretty large and loose uh, and relaxed. You know, that's a, it, there's a certain way that I can read kind of my emotional state of mind in the embroidery and also in the waxing. When I have the wax, I can tell when I'm not fully present because then I start to get splashes and drips all over the pieces versus when I am fully present, I have nicer, neater lines. Thank you so much. Oh, I think that um, is a great like uh, taste for our audience. And hopefully they'll be able to see the work in person as well. Um, so now I'm going to invite our jurors to turn their cameras on and come off of mute and join us for this conversation. So for, um, our, for tonight, we have um, 
Deirdre Darden, um, who uses she, her pronouns, and Antonius Kimbui, who uses they, them pronouns. Um, so they will be joining us to have uh, a conversation with O. So I'm going to be just um, asking them if each of you could talk a little bit about um, how the jury process was for you. I know it was a while ago now, um, but I think it was back in December, January, and that was seems so long ago. But um, if you guys could talk to a little bit about the process, how that was for you and what attracted you to O's work. And then I'll um, probably just ask uh, for you to maybe prompt O with some questions or for you to provide um, your own kind of critical response. Um, so yeah, let's take it from there. Whoever wants to go first. I can go first. So um, my name is Deirdre Darden. I'm an independent curator here in DC. And I was really grateful um, to be brought on as a juror for this solo exhibition. It was my first time juring um, in a few years. And it was also one of the first projects that I worked on in the pandemic, um, you know, after sort of everything closed down and work really slowed up. Um, I got you know, the email to be a juror. So I was really excited to sort of return to work in a way. And the process was really great and fit into the lifestyle of the pandemic where I could take the time to review applications on my own, do everything from home. But then when we got together um, as a juror panel to discuss everyone's applications, I really felt as if I was like back at work and using that muscle again of critical language and just looking at art and reading people's applications. And O stood out to me mostly for the participation aspect of the exhibition. And I really thought that it would have a huge impact of, on the audience um, once it was mounted, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, so to speak, and we're getting back into public spaces, and really that it would provide a lot of opportunity for catharsis, reflection, interaction, just communication um, with people again and through art, which is my favorite way to communicate. So I was really inspired by O's piece. I am familiar with their work and I really thought that it would be a great opportunity as a solo exhibition and made a lot of sense for sort of the emotional state that I think a lot of people were in um, last year and coming into this year. So I'm really proud, you know, to be on the panel. Uh, yes, I concur with all of that. Hi everyone, my name is Antonius Dean Bui. I am a polydisciplinary artist and I'm so honored to be in the presence of Omolara. Thank you for being an artist, for making your work and applying um, for this opportunity. Thank you for Leslie and Torpedo Art Factory for bringing me in. And it was truly an honor to work alongside Deirdre and Michelle. Um, similarly to what Deirdre was saying, I think going through Omalara's proposal, it struck such a chord to know that you've been working on this body of work for years and it feels more relevant than ever. Um, the thoughtfulness and care that you've put into every aspect of the audience's interaction with your work from the engagement, um, sharing their stories. Um, you bring up the word translation a lot. And I think what I love so much about your work, O, is you understood that no singular form of language was enough to really do honor to the immensity of the multiple pandemics we're going through. Um, the vulnerability it takes to share for you, for me, for us. Um, and just seeing the images now, I'm so proud of what you've done. Um, when you talked about the black box theater, like that struck such a chord for me because for me, your work is a rehearsal of mutual aid, collective care. Mm -hmm. It's a glimpse of a queer utopia. 
Um, and I see sound waves within the installation. I see reaching towards the sky. I also see emerging from water. And it's so effective on every single scale, regardless of where you stand. Yeah, I think one of the things that you all have spoke to in responding or talking about your journey process that I, uh, there's so many things, so many ways that I can talk about this work that are all true. Like there are so many truths about like what this work is, what this work is about, why I did this work, how this work came to be. I can tell, which is true for everything, honestly, is that any situation, circumstance, you know, there are so many different ways you could describe it, which would all be true. But one of the things that I definitely highlighted in my application was thinking about catharsis and thinking about people having a moment to reflect on the immense amount. Because a lot of people have been going through certain kinds of, have been forced to go through processes of uh, self-reflection and emotional labor that they otherwise might not have gone through because of the pandemic, because of being isolated, because of spending time by, them, by themselves, they've been forced to learn like, oh, wow, this is really tiring to do this kind of work for other people. Or, oh, I do need to come up with a way to consistently care for myself uh, because it's tiring <laughs> to exist without self-care. And that's actually a thing I need and not a thing that is a, a luxury. And then I love that you describe it as queer utopia because I mean, honestly, I think I've built a little bubble of queer utopia for myself. Uh, that I'm living in and I'm really thankful for that bubble and it's very shocking when I go outside of it I'm like what people don't share resources out here like I don't under what okay I'm going back into the bubble um, but I'm really thankful again to so many of you who are watching who are part of making and holding that bubble for me and that we hold for each other uh, the space I, I do think of it very much as like I want people to be able to have a certain amount of catharsis in the space so like my friend who came in to help me document audience interactions we did that shoot before it opens but i wanted to have those images to express ways people could do it came in and she like rolled around on the walls <laughs> the velcro walls but when you go into the space they're the soft side of the wall of velcro so the walls are like fuzzy uh and my post that i put up when i was starting installation was changing hard white spaces, literally, and it's like it's their hard white walls, uh, into soft black spaces, literally, because now they're soft black walls that you go into, but also metaphorically, this idea of, you know, white supremacist cultural space into a space that's rooted in collectivity, which is something that is just air in the black, <laughs> in the black experience, I would say. And Black experience here could also be, you know, for queer experience or disabled experience. And you talk about accessibility and the multiple kinds of ways. So it's not the reasons why I think about these multiple ways of being able to engage is because I'm actively in community with people who require different forms of communication and engagement. And also because me as a chronically ill uh, and disabled person, it's I often have different ways of engaging. So sometimes I'm in a wheelchair. And so I wanted the things, part of the undulating kind of shape of the installation, it, it was partially intuitive in that I was individually sticking those squares and was like, mm, no, like I want this ombre. I really struggled with the big white door that's in the middle of the piece, which I can pull up a picture of again so people can see it as I'm talking about it. Um, and I was like, oh, how do I create a shape that feels right so it's searching so much for a feeling a lot of times uh, which I liken to when you're singing and you're trying to convey a certain type of of feeling as you're singing a phrase you know you can sing the same phrase a different way uh, and it will convey a different feeling or mood, right? And, and we'll get a taste of that in the performance because I'll be singing the same song every day. But there's different emotive qualities that can go into singing the same words in the same tempo or rate um, or speed of singing with you know the same outline, but it could be sad or playful or joyful. So in thinking about this kind of what kind of shape to build, I was thinking about like children. I always want to think about children and the fact that they're shorter. So in galleries, we have this like line that's the center of the room and that's where you hang things because that makes it accessible to people. 
who are not children because <laughs> children are short <laughs> by nature of being kids. And so it's like making sure that small people could reach things and pull them off and touch them and be able to see them at their eye level was important. Then making sure that people who were seated for whatever reason, whether it's because they're in a wheelchair or because they came in and needed to sit or because they have a walker and they decided to sit on it or because they're sitting on one of these um, kind of platform spaces that I created at either end of this image, you can see one here that hold the projectors, but also serve as places for people to be able to sit and rest uh, while they're in the gallery. Those folks can still, you know, engage with it too. And then thinking about sight and sound and touch, you know, if you are unable to see, and I apologize, I did not have the image descriptions for this uh, slide presentation. That's the thing that I'm still working on as the growing edge, but I'm aware that I didn't do it for this. Uh, then you still have sound and you also can physically touch, you know, the things. So there, there's, it's sensual and engages, meets, has something that can meet everybody where they are, I hope, you know, so that I could confidently and comfortably invite anyone who's in my community to come to this space without having to have a disclaimer for it. Like, oh, we're gonna invite you here, but there are no chairs that you can sit on. Or, oh, I'm gonna invite you <laughs> here, but you won't be able to see anything. Or, oh, I'm gonna invite you, you know, there's all manner of, I'm gonna invite you here, but you know, I can't control what other people are in the space to an extent. So there's that, it's a public space, which means if people wanna be assholes, you know, they can be here doing that. But the things that I have control over, I've worked really hard to think of as many things as I can but not as an extra thing, as part of my process, which is also important. It wasn't just like a, let me add this on to the end. I'm just gonna do this. It was a, this is how I'm designing because this is how we build spaces for each other. So I was just saying for the chat, lots of love, um, lots of really beautiful responses to your work, Elle. Um, but uh, Deirdre and Antonia, so do you have any specific questions you'd like to ask O? Oh, Malara, I love that you use the language of a memorial for this installation. And something that I'm really drawn to is the lack of names attached to each banner. I think there's a lot of power in anonymity. Um, and people feel safer in terms of sharing oftentimes. But there's also something very affirming about seeing your name and knowing that you contributed towards a piece. I'm wondering, can you talk about that decision and how you came upon not including the contributors? Yeah, so the way that I think about, so that has a lot to do with the spaces that I work in. So for five years, I worked in a youth services center, which is a space that houses court involved youth. Youth is defined as 13 to 21 year olds. So DC doesn't have its own uh, juvenile jails. It doesn't have its own baby jails. That's what I call the place you sit because it's babies in jail. Um, when youth are sentenced, they then are sent to adult facilities and then they have to be in isolation because DC does not have its own prisons, you know, long-term holding facilities. And so working there for five years in that space, but then also I've, I've worked in spaces that um, provide services as an art teacher uh, and as an arts administrator that provides services to folks uh, experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity or uh, various other kind of social service based spaces where anonymity is really important because of stigma associated with things, or in the, the case of youth, it's both stigma in terms of being, you know, court involved. And it's also your age, right? In the sense that you don't have the ability to uh, give permission and we protect you as a young person from, you know, having your image used in different ways. And so in those settings, the things that we, that I learned how to do as an artist, uh, organizer, art educator was to be able to engage specificity and to allow people to be identified without identifying them. So it's like ways that you can, yeah, ways that people can, you can actually see people in something 
without having other people be able to identify them. So the choice, for example, to have people hold the squares over their face in that particular way, that form of having people um, be able to participate in something is a form, a safe form of participation that I learned from working in those spaces, which is to say that you can see that it's that person and if you know that person, then you know that it's that person. But if you don't know that person, then they're not necessarily outing themselves. And so it was, there's an interesting way that you say like, yeah, people like to have, you know, props for engaging in a particular thing. And I guess another community that I didn't talk about too is organizing. So in organizing communities, you have people who are able to take different levels of risk or exposure. And so you're navigating um, what is done publicly and what is done privately and how people are positioned. And sometimes someone is credited for doing a thing and, or saying a thing and they're not the person who did it or said it, but they're the person who can afford to have it attached to them in the press or in the public and in the media. And so it's not actually about credit, but it's about you know getting this thing done while also protecting people. And so I think, that for me, it comes more from that sort of space is how can there be a, a layer of protection or anonymity while also um, specificity, you know? So somebody who knows like, but my last piece that I did um, or a last, one of the things that I recently showed publicly was this video of my hands um, tying a miniature noose. And that was, I can pull up the picture of that. And that was, shown in a video and I remember thinking that my hands could be universal and that you know people wouldn't necessarily know that it was my hands. And then my uh, one of my best friends who's been one of my best friends since I was 13 was like, one of the things that I loved about it was that those are your hands and I could identify your hands anywhere, which I was really surprised to hear because I was like, no, it's supposed to be anonymous. But people who know you, know you, you know? And they know those sorts of things and hands are, are actually really intimate part of our body. And so for me, you know, the photos are the most um, intimate way that you can see people's contributions. Whereas yes, with the text, people are not necessarily credited, but there's also just thinking about sometimes when things are a bit sensitive, um, people don't, they want to contribute their story and they wanna be part of the, the narrative I'm talking kind of circularly, but I use this piece to facilitate a group here at the Curry Museum with people who are caretakers and support folks for, for um, family members or loved ones who are experiencing um, substance abuse and substance dependency. And that group is an anonymous group, just like the groups to support people who are directly dealing with substance abuse, like you know, NA, or Narcotics Anonymous, or Alcoholics Anonymous, or if you go to like an eating disorder group, or if you're in any sort of setting where you're receiving counseling or therapy, generally the participants are anonymized, so their identities are protected. Um, and that creates space for people to feel safe to be able to actually share more fully and be more vulnerable. And so I think I was looking at it more not from erasing people's contributions, but actually creating safety for people to be able to be vulnerable and contribute without fear. Thank you so much for that. So I, I do have a question for you, O. Oh. And um, <laughs> so as I, I had some questions, but if, as you've been discussing and giving your presentation, you've sort of touched on all those things, but I'm wondering, I'm just thinking about this now, um, your choice of the poetic inspiration, and then I too sing America is, you know, the legacy of that poem is sort of a confrontation of identity and of presenting, you know, they will not send me back to the kitchen or, you know, I won't go back um, when company comes, they'll have to accept me um, eating at the table with them. And I'm wondering, you know, because your exhibition has such an, a sort of alluring vulnerability as you're discussing and presents this anonymity so that you can kind of confront um, whichever feeling someone might be sharing when they're, you know, reciting something to make for the squares. So I'm just wondering um, if you can talk kind of about 
your inspiration and then switching to we to sing America and presenting this collective voice, this collective catharsis outcry. Um, and what maybe like what is the relation between, you know, staking your identity in America, like the legacy of the poem, and then your exhibition and how it presents more of a come in and view what I've said and less of like a confronting factor. You know, I think, so the We Too Sing America titling of this collection of things, so that's the titling that goes with the projection of the individual images and domestic work, which is the collection of the squares and the performance Walk With Me is the name of the song and I guess the working title of the performance. Uh, when I was titling it, so when I title pieces, I always think of the title as an opportunity to leave a breadcrumb trail. So sometimes as an artist, I um, mourn not having more insight, which is probably because of the generation where I was raised in, where we just had lots of information about people available to us. But I mourn not having more insight or information about elders. And there's like always celebration when a new image is unearthed and you're like, oh shit, I'm sorry oh crap, those people were best friends, like this person was with that person and they knew each other, that makes so much sense, you know? And for me as an artist, I'm always looking back for breadcrumbs to understand like, how did these people navigate this? Like who was helping them? Who was in their circle? What conversations were they having in different ways? And I leave breadcrumbs partially through my titling. So, so many of my titles, um, some of them are just purely descriptive but a lot of them are pulled from literary works because I read works voraciously. It's like that story of the very hungry caterpillar that's like me, but with books. Um, and that's also the story of my diminishing bank account. Um, it's just like, bye, <laughs> there it goes into the bookshop cart again. Um, so it's leading a breadcrumb trail in one way about like, these are the things that I'm reading and these are the, the black intellectuals that I'm in conversation with. Um, sometimes it's other artists like, um, whew, her name just blew, Barbara Trace Ribbled, every time a knot is untied, a god is loose, which I thought about for that news piece a lot, and she was also a poet, um, but then it's like Langston Hughes, where it's like, the thing that I thought about was, yeah, that poem, and when I originally wrote the For Us, so that's one answer to it, is it's a breadcrumb trail for people to understand some of the research. Artists aren't required to and don't do bibliographies. I think that we should, but that's another conversation. Um, of whose work we've stolen from or borrowed from, like in terms of visual artists, because a lot of times- we're References. Work yeah. References, but also sometimes it's straight thievery, I'm not gonna name any names, um, or borrowing or being like, oh, I can take that idea and make it better. Um, but also like who made my work possible is something I think about what people's labor. So my personal life, again, there are a lot of people watching where it's like your labor made my work possible because you housed me, you fed me, you had conversations with me, you helped me move this thing to here or buy this thing so I could be able to do my work. So there's a lot of people whose work this is, you know, this piece, but then there's also in terms of lineage, it's like what artists made the way for it to be possible for me to apply for this thing. You think of Alma Thomas having to apply for a show anonymized and people not knowing that she was a black woman because black people weren't allowed to make art, you know, at that time. And then winning the competition and people being like, oh shit, you black, oops, you know, as a thing. And so that's important to me is being like, these people made my work possible. And so that, that, era of Harlem Renaissance writers and artists and people who were all in each other's living rooms made my work possible. That's important. That's one aspect of it. And then thinking about for us visually, um, it can read for us as in like for us, but it can also read for us as in capital U.S. as in the United States, as in our country and our nation. And during the time of COVID, there was this collective work thing happening but there's also this thing that I've talked about a lot here in New England, which is I saw a lot of patriotism happening in a very particular way. Like I've seen more flags in the last year. And I don't know if it's because I was in Boston and Boston rides hard for the US like that. Uh, but now I'm in Manchester and I'm like, y'all got a lot of US flags. I didn't grow up with this kind of, you know, 
worship of the country, but has me thinking a lot about the our relationship, the us relationship to the US and us from my perspective of who us is for me as like poor, queer, black, disabled immigrant, you know, people and on and on and on, um, raised in the United States in in this country. And I think thinking about those parallels and questions of like, why do why do certain people fly the flag? Like being in the New England for the amount of time I've been now, I've realized that people in New England fly the US flag for the same reason that people in the South fly the rebel flag or the Confederate flag, that it's not, there's not always a difference between the two flags and that people don't always mean the same thing when they're flying the same flags. Um, and there's a lot of coded language that happens in there. And so I chose that we too sing America. Um, I, you said like that you felt that mine was not as confrontational. And I actually do feel like it's directly confrontational. And again, the, the poem that I, that I started the For Yous with, and this, the title of that piece, Domestic Work, is this idea of this Black woman's labor, you know, in this white house, white houses. And I think of it as like, we are doing this labor. And you think of, you know, Black women historically always doing the labor that makes the United States of America possible. And that's, you know, emotional labor, that's physical labor, that's also thinking about um, reproductive slavery, where it's like the labor of bringing children into the world, literally being something that built the country. And so for me, it actually is um, confrontational and changing the I from, from I too to we too was to acknowledge the collective nature of this story. I mean, I think Langston Hughes' poem is written in the first person, but it also is a poem that speaks to the larger plight of, of Black folks. And in this one, I just felt like the I, I wanted to be very explicit about the collective. I wanted people to think collective at all times. And I, in this moment, I'm thinking for the, the bit of the installation that I showed uh, that was here at the Courier Museum when I was facilitating the group, uh, one of the things that was said, a participant was like, I saw those squares on the wall and I was reading those class squares and I was like, man, that's a really strong, resilient group of people. And then when I talked about the work later, he was like, oh, those people are all you. <laughs> that's all an individual <laughs> person. Like, wow. You know, he was kind of like, that smacked me in the face, the realization that this was one person who had these many truths. But I... For the installation, I do want people to read it as many people because it's not just me. Um, it is a group of us. And I think there were two questions that I saw in the chat, which have now been posted in our chat. One of them was about when I reach the goal of 14, 1,440 fabric squares, will I feel that the work is complete or will I find new ways to bring the audience in and add on to the work? Um, I know when work is complete because it tells me that it's complete. And so sometimes I set these arbitrary goals for myself so that I have something to work towards. Um, often there's meaning in the numbers that I choose. So that was for every minute of the day. And honestly, at first I was like, I wanna make one for every second of the day. But then I did the math and I was like, ooh, 86,440. Uh, that's a lot. I don't know about that. <laughs> So I was like, let's do the math for every minute of the day and see if I can get to that. So to answer that question, I would say one thing that I've learned particularly recently is that the work tells me when it's done. I don't tell it when it's done. And I, as an artist, have been listening more deeply to the work when it tells me what it wants to be or how it wants to be or what a new iteration of it is. And this work, again, has been an excellent teacher for me in terms of releasing control in so many ways. Cause it's like, every time I wax one of those individual squares, it's like an experiment where, you know, sometimes I accidentally splash or something drips and then the wax cause it's hot just rolls across the square. And it's like, man, the lettering was perfect. And now it's hot wax in fabric. Do I boil it all out for the square to go back and fix it or, Am I releasing control and just saying that is like, this is what this moment is for this square. So there's been a lot of releasing control for me 
in this piece, in this moment, in terms of uh, pandemic, in this installation, Leslie can tell you about the story of getting that Velcro up on the walls. <laughs> how, how much we, we both, or I personally would like to add a line to my CV that says that I can upholster walls because I feel like it's a whole new skill that I should get a line for in my CV because it was hard. And then a question that Ludlin is asking is, can I talk more about my use of indigo? Uh, indigo is particular to me for a couple of, for several reasons. So in my other research as a fiber artist, I uh, had first started to study batik because my dad, who is Yoruba, which is an ethnic group in the colonized area now known as Nigeria, um, traded, brought back from Lagos batiks that were done in Nigeria, and I loved the texture of them since I was a child. And when I got older, I was like, I want to learn how to do that. And then I looked it up, and I was like, this is an Indonesian thing? Okay. And then at some point, because I couldn't figure out how to study it here in the United States, I found a portion of a class at the uh, Montgomery College, which is a community college uh, in the DMV area, that had like a batiking portion and I kind of took that, but then was like, okay, I'm just gonna have to go to Indonesia to learn how to do this. And so I self-funded a trip to Indonesia to go and study it there. And I learned that indigo was one of the, the bases for, so it's blue and then it's this brown that's called soga brown. And then there's this red and those are the, the colors that are, you don't really see blue, you see black, brown and white in a lot of the um, textiles that are batiks that you see here. But the way that they get the black is the mixing of the brown, the soga brown with the blue, and then the white is the raw fabric. And then you have the blue and white batiks, which are super traditional, but you don't see them in the kind of fetishized orientalist um, trading of batiks that happens here in the West, or I had never seen indigo. I didn't know that indigo was an integral part of that. And likewise, when I got to go to Nigeria for the first time in 2016, unfortunately for the funeral of a relative, my aunt, we were in the market, I wanted to go buy textiles and my aunt was like, you wanna understand like real Yoruba textiles, uh, adire, that's what it is. And so she introduced me to these blue and white indigo dyed cloths and was like, these are our kind of most sacred, like most Yoruba cloth. And I was like, I had no, nobody, I've, I've grown up with this African print cloth, which I know is Dutch wax print and I know it was made in the Netherlands, but I had no idea about this Adire and then Ashoke, which is a woven um, cloth that is made by Yoruba people. And so those two encounters, which happened in this over the span of like two years, also in that time I traveled to Brazil and South Africa and was notice, noticing the prevalence of Dutch wax print uh, and also learning that Dutch wax print was a bastardization of Indonesian batik that the Dutch could not sell to Indonesian people because they were like, what is this? This is not it. You know, so then they sold it as they were going back around the coast of the African continent to African people were like, this is cool. Like we like this, these colors are great. Uh, and now you have the proliferation of Dutch wax print fabric then supplanting and creating a market such that it's hard for local textile producers who are doing traditional, you know, craft work and textile work in spaces unable to support their work because people want these mass produced, European produced and designed Dutch wax print. And so for me, Indigo is a connector to my lineage um, in, in one way, so directly to my Yoruba lineage. It's a nod to the influence of Indonesian batik in my life and also to textiles on the continent. And then it's a connection to the labor. Again, this piece is about labor, but thinking about intellectual, emotional, and physical labor of Black people in the United States, you know, like textiles, but also indigo was a major product of the South. And the reason why the South was able to produce indigo was because of the knowledge that enslaved folks brought over with them of how to make it and produce it. But when you look in his history books, you know, they have these names of white people whose names I won't say out loud because that's a form of resistance. It's like, I'm not gonna, gonna participate in these false histories that kind of canonize or celebrate these people, but you have these white folks who get credited with like, this person brought indigo to the United States. And you're like, was this person in the field picking indigo? 
was this person in the vats you know, with the indigo? Did they have blue hands? Uh, and so indigo for me connects me to this lineage of um, people who were enslaved and who innovated and resisted and rose and continue to do that here in this land, black people. And also to black folks um, from my biological lineages who are carrying on arts into the next generation. And so that's some of the significance of, of indigo for me. Ironically, blue is my least favorite color, um, <laughs> but it's the color that I work with <laughs> because it's a color that connects me uh, to those practices. So um, unless anyone else has um, more questions, I'd like to um, just take a minute to read Michelle Carlson's statement. Oh, I don't think you've heard it yet. So I wanted to give you a chance to hear it. And also, you know, if you- um, And she's the third juror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Michelle is the um, third juror who couldn't be here today. Um, so I thought it would just be great for me to just read uh, Michelle's statement on the work. Um, so Michelle says, we too sing America is staggeringly human and a methodical collection of lived experience in a time where our humanness is laid at its most bare. While Malara Williams McAllister offers visitors the opportunity to write in their own testimonies on printed space of cloth that they may choose to either take home are placed within the larger collective voice of the installation. This is the striking act of collectivizing grief. Yet McAllister seems keenly aware this community is not a monolith and that while viewers may all participate, the choice to keep their contribution is a subtle allowance that acknowledges that we might share this time, but we also experience and move through it differently. This recognition of autonomy made manifest through a simple choice is not just generosity, but it also demonstrates the trust and reciprocity at the heart of a collaboration and collective action, all needed to survive our current moment. Perhaps then this is a creative space of hope constructed for us by us that is most urgent and essential to remembering that we are not alone. A notion of course central to many of our experiences of isolation during the pandemic but also one deeply felt by BIPOC folks on a daily basis. To bear witness to the space that McAllister creates, um, but also the ritual that O weaves in and around the installation is evidence that what will get us through this time and what drives us forward movements for social justice is ongoing, durational, and takes every one of us. Thanks for reading that. So I wanted to just give Michelle a shout out. Um, thank you, Michelle, uh, for your contributions to this, um, to O uh, being selected for this exhibition. Um, and I'd also just like to thank Deirdre and Antonius for joining us this evening um, and for their uh, contributions to this opportunity. It's, it was a pleasure working with you guys. So I'm really happy that you guys got to join um, O and I for this conversation today. And of course, a huge acknowledgement for the work that O has put into this exhibition. Um, I think, you know, as the curator of this space, I can just, um, you know, say that this was uh, one of the most ambitious solo shows that we've had. And I think that it comes at the right time as well. Like this is a moment where we do need to be thinking collectively. And this is a really, um, for those of you who've been in the Target Gallery and the Torpedo Factory, this is a really uh, great space to have that conversation um, because we we do get a pretty high a visitor, um, visitor visitation essentially. Um, so the amount of visibility that this exhibition is gonna get and interaction I, is something that I'm very excited about. Um, and so I would like to just thank O for taking the time to share um, thoughts and insights into this exhibition. And um, I would like to um, just thank all of you all for joining us this evening. And um, if you have, let me see if I'm, um, is there anyone else who have any more questions? Oh, would you, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, one of the questions that was asked, Ms. Belinda asked, so I briefly mentioned that there would be a durational performance and that it would happen every day. 
And it was asked, is there a time and date for that? So that is going to start on uh, the 24th of June. There's a lot of 24s there. There's gonna be 24 hours. It's gonna be 24 days. There's gonna be an hour a day. So it'll be 24 hours. Um, and it'll start on June 24th. It'll happen every day starting at noon. So from noon uh, to 1 p.m. from June 24th until July 18th when the exhibition goes down. And we're hoping to be able to have that live in person in the galleries and also live streamed so that people can experience it from their homes as well. Uh, people are welcome, yeah, to come and be in the gallery during that time if they like to. We're still working with a limited space just around like safety and, and navigating that. So that's a thing to, to think about as you're considering coming um, or not. And the piece itself will be up through the 18th. And we're also gonna be doing a special um, outdoor uh, performance as well, which will be um, on almost exactly a month from now, um, July 9th. And we're aiming to do that around sunset. So 8, 8.30ish. Um, and that will be a continuation of um, O oh, singing performance, but outside. And it'll be a lovely moment with the sunset outside. And we'll invite uh, folks to come back into the gallery with us afterward. Yep. Um, so, I, I think also one thing to mention is that the Targa Gallery and Torpedo Factory is open Wednesday through Sunday currently, um, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, so that's something to note, um, although we are subject to change, I guess, um, depending on how the city of Alexandria um, dictates. So we'll see um, if we would need to open seven days. I, I think Owen and I will have a conversation of, of how to approach that. but. For right now, we're going to do um, noon um, from the June 24th through July 18th for the performances. So I hope to see some of you there. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And I'm really excited if anybody, I'm really excited to receive kind of critical feedback uh, about the piece and about the show as it evolves. So. If you have questions or you have reflections, I would love to hear them and you can post them either in the chat on this video or you can DM me on Instagram or Facebook. I, I would just love to know how it's landing with people. That's important to me. So yeah, thanks for tuning in, tuning in and thanks to Deidre and Antonius for taking the time to be here and share your questions and reflections with me. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll wrap us up here. Um, and I just hope that, you know, all of you who are watching stay in touch and, you know, approach O with questions as you like and to stay engaged with this exhibition because we have a lot more coming, which is exciting. Um, so again, um, thank you all and um, stay tuned. There's a little bit more for the virtual late shift component. So, um, our, my coworkers will take over in just a second to uh, make that switch. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everyone. Um, as Leslie mentioned, um, this, this has been a component of the Late Shift. This is our virtual um, artist talk, and there's actually been activities happening around the art center as well during this time. So I just wanna do a quick acknowledgement for what's happening first by start by screen sharing um, a video that talks about Torpedo Factory. So bear with me one second.
So that's a little teaser about what we've been doing during this time. And, and thank you guys for supporting Torpedo Factory during this past year. Uh, you, although things are a little bit different, we are still here. Uh, we actually are doing some in-person activities tonight. But first, I wanted to give thanks to the Factory Society for providing us with Zoom access for tonight's event. Um, so Factory Society is pull up their screen here. So this is their website, factorysociety.org. They focus on educating and inspiring a community of emerging art collectors. Um, so you can find out more information about Factory Society. If you notice on this page, they have upcoming events. They actually had talks about art collecting. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram for more information. Um, they've partnered with us many times before. You can also support them by subscribing uh, and find out more about their upcoming events. Um, at the Factory Society, uh, Grace, Gratefully, we're, we, we appreciate their support of Torpedo Factory by providing this virtual component. Uh, definitely made things very smooth and uh, really grateful for, for the talk that we've had. So, and I also would like to, to give a thanks to Safe Space Nova. Safe Space Nova, Nova is dedicated to providing a safe, accepting, and supportive environment to combat social stigmas, bullying, and other challenges faced by LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, we actually have a table with Safe Space Nova here at the Art Center this evening. So if you happen to be in the area, please stop by. You're welcome to take a look, uh, find out some more information about them. They have a few things you can take with you as well. Um, and I also have a message from the director, Jordan Costin, um, just for for folks during this time. So grateful to have Jordan's support during this, um, during this pandemic. And uh, they've been a a wonderful ally for many years for ALX Pride. Uh, they've been with us since the beginning when we first started this in 2018. second. Okay. My name is Jordan Costin. I'm the executive director of Safe Space Nova, a nonprofit that was founded right here in the city of Alexandria. What do we do? We provide positive programming for LGBTQ youth across Northern Virginia. You ever think to yourself, I'm having a bad day? Nobody likes me, I don't feel accepted. We know that a lot of our youth, LGBTQ youth, feel that every single day. They're three, time, three to five times more likely to experience that. And we're here to say, you're not alone, you're accepted and you're loved. And that's a message for everybody who's watching this video right now. You're not alone, you're accepted and you're loved. Safe Space Nova says it, we believe it, and so do I. We want you to feel welcome, enjoy the festivities and everything it has to offer. Thank you. And alongside Safe Space Nova, I just want to take a moment to also thank to the, our partners who are at the event today. Um, first up, there's Printmakers Inc. They are offering a printmaking project on the first floor. Uh, originally, it was going to be on the waterfront side, but due to the weather, we brought everything inside to the atrium space. So if you happen to be in the area, please stop by. They also are, they have a studio space up on the third floor. So feel free to check them out on the days when we are open at the Art Center. And also, I want to thank to, um, if you see here on the ALX Pride page, we also have an exhibition with the U-Haul uh, Gallery. U-Haul is a queer gallery that highlights and centers the work and experience of queer and lesbian artists. And it's a creating curated by Kat Baker. Um, tonight's activities, we have about five, six different artists. These are profiles of, of each of them. Um, now the works are gonna be in the back of U-Haul trucks and they're parked right outside on Union Street. So we encourage you to stop by and take a look at them. Uh, that's gonna be happening until about, I believe, 9, 9.30 this evening. Um, so you're welcome to stop by and check it out. And they will also be at the Art Center all day tomorrow. Uh, I believe the hours are gonna be from 12 to five. So you're welcome to stop by and support that. So um, that wraps up in terms of the activities that we have in person. Feel free to stop by and you know check us out. Again, we'll be back for late shift next month, uh, do another hybrid component on Friday, June 9th. So but in the meantime, just want to thank you for being a part of this. Um, 
please keep supporting the Art Center and the work that we do and also all the artists we have. We have over 80 studios, over 150 artists, uh, three floors to explore. Uh, we are open tomorrow from 10 to 6 and as well on Sunday from 10 to 6. So thank you again for being a part of this tonight and take care.